Well, good morning to all of you. God bless you all, and thank you very much for letting me read the Bible with you. This morning, we're going to start out in Genesis chapter 1, verse 1. In the beginning, God. You'll notice the word God is in bold typeset here in Genesis chapter 1, verse 1, and that's because the word God in this verse is a figure of speech to emphasize God's greatness. Nothing was ahead of him in time, nor in rank. Everything came from him, and everything is to bow to him, acknowledging his supremacy. This is the Bible's first truth. He is God. Genesis chapter excuse me, Psalm 145, verse 3. Great is the Lord, and greatly to be praised, and his greatness is unsearchable. Great, greatly, greatness. God is the great one. Proverbs chapter 1, verse 7. The reverence of the Lord is is the beginning of knowledge. God is the beginning of all knowledge. He is the, this is the beginning of knowledge. He is the great one. His creation displays his love, his power, and his existence. He repeatedly calls attention to his greatness because a deception blinds mind, blinds eyes to his greatness. Job, the first usage of a word or a truth reveals fundamental information about that word or truth. This principle will come up repeatedly in this study. Job 38 reveals why, why God created everything Job 38, when, the word when is time, I laid the foundations of the earth. And this is the time, of course, of Genesis chapter 1, verse 1 that we just read. Verse 7, when, again, time, the morning stars sang together and all the sons of God shouted for joy. When? God created the heavens and the earth. The angels sang and shouted for joy, meaning they sang God a chorus of praise for the magnificence of his work. When Lucifer, Gabriel, Michael, and all the other angels saw the heavens and the earth, they glorified God for what he had done. Since the angels applauded God's work when he created the heavens and the earth, the angel must, angels must have, by simple logic, preceded the heavens and the earth. Since they sang and shouted for joy when he created, this was, or this is, the first recorded act of God's created beings revealing why God created beings. Angelic and later human beings were created for praiseful fellowship with God, and this is love. When Job 38 is added by scripture buildup, the events of Genesis 1-1 are God created all the angels, then he created the heaven and the earth. Then Lucifer and the other angels sang God a chorus of praise for his creative greatness. Praise to God is the first recorded act and therefore the therefore purpose of his created beings. This truth recorded in the Bible's first view, verse, lays the foundation for all that follows in the Bible, in this study, and in our lives. 
God first formed the man's body. That was the first thing that he made of man when he originated man. Secondly, God made or put soul life into the body. Then thirdly, God created man's spirit. But I'd like you to notice the order that God recorded it in. Genesis chapter 1, verse 27. God created man in his own image, and this was the spirit part, and this is what God recorded first. And the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground. This is the body part of man. It was recorded second. And then God recorded, and God breathed into man's nostrils, and man became a living soul. Though it was created last, spirit is recorded first in Genesis 1.27. This placed emphasis on man's spirit part. Man's purpose was a loving, reverential fellowship with God, which man did by way of the spirit that God put into man. When God originated man, spirit was his most important part, implied in that part being recorded first. Isaiah chapter 43, I have created and that was the spirit part, for my glory, for implies purpose. I have formed him, man, that's the body part. Yea, I have made him, that's the soul part. Again, spirit created is listed first, though it occurred last. Man's spirit part was created for God's glory. God recorded these things in the same sequence in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, where he said, your spirit, soul, and body be preserved blameless. Again, the first thing recorded that God recorded about man was his spirit part. <laughs> Revelation chapter 4, verse 11 Thou art worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power, for thou hast created all things, and note these important words, and for thy, for God's pleasure, they are and were created. We were created for God's pleasure, not our own. Yes, of course, he wants us to have pleasure, and we, especially born-again ones, richly do. But that is not why we were created. We were created for God's pleasure. Not a, Man was created to give glory to God. Romans chapter 11, for to him, that's God, and through God, and to God, are all things. Creation and our new birth are to him, so he can get the praiseful fellowship. This was God reproducing his nature of love in his beings. The beginning of knowledge is God in bold typeset. God is the great one and should be revered Everything was created so he could have the pleasure of praiseful fellowship. This is the purpose of the ages. This PowerPoint is provided so we can easily read the verses together. It is a condensed version of the booklet Alive Unto God, and the booklet Alive Unto God is basically a transcript of what I'm speaking to you today. And in that booklet, uh, it has extensive notes and appendixes with supportive documentation of the truths we are reading. It also has explanation of abbreviations. For example, later on, we're going to see the abbreviation WET, 
which is an abbreviation for least expanded translation. And you're of course welcome to ask for a copy of this booklet at the open scroll uh, at comcast.net. This PowerPoint will include notations like the following examples below. For example, in Job 37, when we read it earlier and there was a notation of the word Lucifer in bracket with a footnote four, I've highlighted it for you to bring attention to it. Now in the footnotes of the booklet, it explains why the word Lucifer was embedded into that verse for you. Or at the end of verse seven, behind the word joy is the footnote five uh, highlighted. There's explanation of about this shouted for joy or W-E-T, uh, as I just explained, or in uh, Romans 6, 3, behind the word one is the footnote 29 highlighted in the booklet. Uh, or at the bottom, you'll see Appendix 6 highlighted. In the booklet, there are extensive footnotes and highlightings, uh, excuse me, ex extensive footnotings and appendixes, because in this presentation, with its brevity, I need to just keep moving quickly, but there is thorough uh, biblical documentation of all that I am saying. Now, in uh, Genesis chapter 1, verse 1 again, God revealed a few details about his Genesis 1-1 creating. In the beginning, God created, and as we've already discussed, the first thing he created was all the angels, because if they were there to applaud, they had to have preceded the heavens and the earth. And specifically of Lucifer, God recorded Ezekiel chapter 28, and thou, Lucifer, you sealest up the sum, you are full of wisdom and you're perfect in beauty. Thou uh, wast perfect in the ways, in thy ways from the day that thou wast created. God especially adorned and exalted Lucifer. Lucifer and all the angels, they lovingly glorified God. They watched what God did in the creating of the heavens and the earth, and they said, oh, Wow, look at what he did for his creative greatness. But eventually, Lucifer's tune changed to a discordant key of selfishness. Ezekiel 28, till iniquity was found in thee, Lucifer, thine heart was lifted up because of thy beauty. Thou hast corrupted thy wisdom by reason of thy brightness. Isaiah chapter 14, verse 12. How art thou fallen? Oh, what a question. Lucifer, you saw what God did. How could you have rebelled against him after seeing his magnificence? How art thou fallen, O Lucifer, son of the morning? For thou hast said, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the star God. I will sit upon the mount. I will ascend above. I will be like the most high. Please note the highlighted. I, 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 Lucifer, glorifying and exalting himself. Revelation chapter 12, when this exalting of self took place, there was a war in the heaven against the dragon, against Satan. God had made Lucifer his second in command. Oh, he was full of wisdom, perfect in beauty. He had enjoyed, God had enjoyed Lucifer's love and Lucifer's reverence. At this stage, Lucifer was bowing before God and humbly yielding to God's lordship. Yet Lucifer rebelled, 
corrupting himself into an I, 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 I being, defiling his hallowed fellowship and position. This was an appalling response to God's remarkable love and history's most horrific event. I know since then there have been terrible events in history, but they are all a byproduct of this horrific event of Lucifer exalting himself above God or trying to exalt himself. God's creation had been rich with only love up to this point, but now there was I, 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 I. There was a selfish self-exaltation. Lucifer's rebellion caused God to grieve. Ezekiel 28, take up a lamentation, and the word lamentation means a passionate expression of grief. Oh, perhaps when a, like when a loved one dies, we might have a lamentation or an expression of grief. And this grief was on account of the king of Tyrus, referring to Lucifer figuratively, and say unto him, Lucifer, it grieved God when Lucifer selfishly rebelled. Lucifer had been adorned and exalted above all the other angels and just should have said to God, thank you for all you've made me to be. Thank you for exalting me. Rather, Lucifer wanted more. Lucifer's rebellion caused a war in the heavens, which ruined the earth. But God won the war, and then he started to restore his creation in Genesis chapter 1 to what he called a very good second heaven and earth. This second heaven and earth included Adam and Eve, who were created for loving, praiseful fellowship with God, like what the angels had been created for. Having spirit, body, and soul, Adam and Eve originally lived love to God, humbly yielding to him, reverentially adoring and bowing before him with obedience. By spirit, God talked to them and he coached them. He told them things and they lovingly obeyed what he told them. But something horrible happened. Genesis chapter 2, in the day that thou eatest of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, thou shalt surely die. And Satan said unto the woman, you shall be as gods. And when the woman saw that the tree was good, it was pleasant, it was desired, she took, did eat gave also unto her husband with her, and he did eat. God had previously warned them that selfish self-exaltation of eating of the tree would cause death the day, that very day, not just someday in the future. Well, they exalted themselves. They ate and died. <laughs> Genesis 5.3. And Adam lived 130 years. Adam could die in Genesis 3, 6, yet lived in Genesis 5, 3, because as we read earlier, Adam had two kinds of life. God gave him first physical life, which God recorded in Genesis chapter 2, verse 7, but God also gave Adam spiritual life, which he recorded earlier in Genesis 1.27. He had life, Adam had life in two categories. The day he ate, he died spiritually, but he continued to live physically. Death simply is the absence of life. The day Adam and Eve ate, they died spiritually because spirit life became absent. Now, after disobeying and losing spirit, let's note Adam's degraded condition. 
Genesis chapter 3, Adam and his wife, they hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God. Verse 10, and Adam said, I heard thy voice and I was afraid because I was naked and I hid myself. Thorns and thistles unto dust shalt thou return, meaning physical uh, sickness and death. Afraid, sickness, physical death. The, rep the repeat of the pronoun I, 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 following Lucifer's lead, hid from God. Man and the earth became terribly degraded. Man pitifully became just body and soul, separated from God, but wrongly thinking, well, we shall be as gods. God had designed man to manage life by reverential obedience to the inspiration to God's spirit or to the spirit part that God had given man. But now they were managing their life by the only part they had, their body and soul, by their limited five senses. And this caused all sorts of problems, the degraded conditions uh, uh, that we just read. Without God's spirit of love, they became selfish and they became inefficient. Adam's digression into being just body and soul is more than an interesting historical fact. It describes what we are born into. Genesis chapter 5, verse 3, Adam begat a son in his own, look at these words, in his own likeness, and after his image. Oh, this is so enlightening and sad. By this time, Adam's image was just body and soul. Offspring are born, or excuse me, offspring are the same genus as their parents, having like characteristics. When a giraffe is born, or when a giraffe is pregnant, when the baby is to be born, we know it's going to be a baby giraffe, and it's going to have characteristics just like the parent had. Offspring are always the same genus as their parents with like characteristics. As descendants, we are all hideously born having just body and soul, for we are all born as Adam's descendants. The impact of this is huge, a terrible digression. Previously, man had been in God's image, which was spirit. Now man was in Adam's fallen image of being just body and, sp and, body and soul. This explains all wrong behavior, individually and historically, of all mankind. The image of Adam caused us being in the image of Adam has caused us to be born with a nature that the Bible calls sin, which will be discussed later, a nature prone to sins. Genesis chapter 6. And the God looked upon the earth, and behold, it was corrupt, for all flesh had corrupted his way upon the earth. Being of Adam's genus, they could not do otherwise. Genesis chapter 4, verse 26, and to Seth was born a son, and Seth called his son Enos. Many times parents are anticipating the birth of their child, and they have excited discussions about what fitting and beautiful name they want to use for their child. Well, when Seth was moving towards the birth of his son, and he debated what name to give, the name that he gave was Enos, which means depraved, mortal, frail, 
Can you imagine some of you or your children having discussions about the birth of their child and they come up with, well, let's call our child depraved. Oh, the patriarchs knew man's terrible state of being just body and soul, even name, naming their offspring to describe their terrible state. Jeremiah chapter 17, the sin of Judah is written with a pen of iron and with the point of a diamond. This sin is graven upon the table of their heart because of their nature, their genus, being in the image of Adam. The heart is deceitful above all things and desperately, mortally sick, incurable. Man became a hideous, defective, beastly. We shall be as God's being, having no spirit of love and a slave to his fleshly lusts. This sin nature produces Galatians 5's works of the flesh, Matthew 15's evil heart, Romans 3's all the world is guilty. God did not say back in Genesis 2, if you eat of the tree, you will have sickness, lack problems with other people. He simply warned, thou shalt surely die. You will lose spirit, which then causes every individual, societal, and historical problem. Genesis chapter 3, I, 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 we were born I, I, I beings. Romans chapter 11, verse 36 is of him and through him and to him are all things has been degraded to of me, through me and to me are all things. Because humans are I, I, I beings. And this has caused personal failure and it causes friction between people, either individually or on a national level. Revelation chapter four, for thou, God, hast you created all things. And now he explains why. And for thy pleasure, they are and were created. Sadly, for my pleasure is the ordinary. Yet all things were created for God's pleasure, not ours. Christianity is not firstly about what we get, though we get richly. But Christianity, its inception was for what God gets, which is reverential, obedient, loving fellowship. This puts Christianity into the category of love, rather than if Christianity is just about what I get, then Christianity is selfishness. Romans chapter 8, verse 20, for the creation was made subject to vanity, meaning meaningless results and disappointing misery not willingly, not purposefully, consider some of the meaningless activities people are devoted to. Since our purpose is love to God, all else is secondary at best. Yes, I love all of you watching this video and part of this fellowship because of your love for God and your dedication to him. But our love is not first and foremost to each other. Our love is first and foremost to God Almighty. Misery is not fundamentally because of where we work or family friction, but because of what Adam made us to be. Adam did not purposely damage us. He didn't sit with Eve and go, you know, if we disobey, we can ruin all of our descendants. Because Adam did not realize the full effects of what he was doing. He unintentionally subjected all of us, all of his descendants, to slavery, to Satan, 
and a distortion of their God-given desires. History and experience tell us something is fundamentally wrong. Frustrated with themselves and others, people try countless religions, religious, philosophical, and legal methods to end mankind's wretchedness. But the root cause of having no spirit is rarely recognized. Rather than symptom reduction, there should be an enjoyment of God's solution to the cause, which we will discuss later in this study. Romans chapter 7. The good that I would, I do not, but the evil which I would not, that I do. O oh, wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me? We have all experienced the good that I would, I do not. God added two laws which reduce sins and their damages, the Mosaic law and the law written in the heart. The Mosaic laws, thou shalt not kill, can cause some to not kill, reducing murders. Secondly, the law written in the heart, summarized by Jesus Christ, whatsoever you would that men should do to you, do ye even to them. This will also slightly suppress the sin nature, encouraging us to treat others as we would like to be treated. But frequently, the evil that I would not that I that I do. Mankind's greatest problem is not what they do, but what they are because of Adam. Adam's condition after losing spirit, his activities of like blaming, selfishness, guilt, feeling deficient, condemning himself, prone to sickness and death, etc., these things describe what humans are born into. Lucifer exalted himself above God, then led Adam into the same error. Man lost spirit, became just body and soul. This pitiful condition is passed down to all humans, so we are all born in Adam's fallen image. Laws and man-made solutions only slightly suppress the rotten fruit of man's terrible fallen nature. So far, what we have talked about exposes and builds a loathing of what Adam did to mankind. If this study ended here, it might cause us all to become discouraged misanthropes. You know, I, I enjoy that word, misanthropes. It means a hater of mankind. It means one who wants to avoid other people. Well, if all we have left is what we've read so far, and everybody is born in Adam's image and is prone to sins, well, then we try to isolate ourselves from other humans to avoid the damage they bring. But in the next section, we will begin to read about God's solution to man being just body and soul and begin to see the path to freedom from the sin nature habits so we can live love to God and others. John chapter 3. Wonderful words by Jesus Christ, a remarkable revelation. John 3 that which is born of the flesh is flesh. And that, of course, is our first birth in the image of Adam. With it comes characteristics from Adam, like two eyes, two arms. Sadly, also comes with that is the nature of Adam of being just body and soul, no longer having spirit. But the verse continues, and that which is born of the spirit is spirit, and that is our second birth. Our first birth gives us body and soul. Jesus Christ, though, made available a second birth, 
a birth of spirit in us so we can be spirit, body, and soul like Adam originally was. Two births gives a Christian two natures. God calls the first birth's nature by a number of different names in the Bible, including the flesh and sin. He calls the second birth's nature by a number of names also, including spirit and the divine nature. Now, rightfully, we could stop right here and spend a good lengthy time just developing these names in the scriptures and documenting them scripturally, but for time's sake, I need to keep moving. But supplemental study material is available that I can suggest if you want to, and rightfully, perhaps you should see why I said what we just said about these names of these two natures. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 3, we all order our behavior in the sphere of the cravings of our evil nature, that is the sin nature, the flesh, continually practicing the desires of our evil nature and of our thoughts. This evil sin nature is what we get in our first physical birth. Romans chapter 6 Shall we continue in the sin, nature, noun? Sin here is not a verb, action, meaning wrong behavior. This word sin grammatically is a noun. From Adam we got a sin nature. Now the typesetting nature in bold print noun will be explained a little bit later. Second Peter chapter one, that which that you might be partakers of the divine nature. When we get born again, we receive a second nature, the divine nature, which is a spirit nature of love. Romans chapter five, God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit. The gift of Holy Spirit is God's love nature poured into us. The saved have two natures, a sin nature and a divine nature. The sin nature produces sin. The divine nature produces the fruit of the Spirit, including love. Romans chapter 5, verse 18. By the offense of one... Adam, judgment came upon all men to condemnation. Yes, that's what we read about. The offense was Genesis 2, or 3, 6s, and he did eat. And it brought judgment upon all men to condemnation. That is Genesis 5, 3s. And we were all born in Adam's fallen image because by God's love and justice, everything is always born after the image of their parent, and praise God for that law and the effect that it has on life. Even so, by the righteousness of one, Jesus Christ, the free gift came upon all men unto justification, which is an issuing in of life. God justly paid for Adam's disobedience and justification Issuing in life is accomplished. Saved man, who had been just body and soul, now had issued into them a second kind of life, spirit life, which is a second nature, a new nature, giving them a new genus. These two natures within us are at conflict within Galatians chapter 5, verse 17. The evil nature constantly has a strong desire to suppress. Now, this is interesting. This is written to born again ones. And even though they are saved and they have a new nature, it still says 
the evil nature is constantly, it has a strong desire to suppress. So that evil nature must still be in the unsaved and all in the saved. And I'll explain that in just a few minutes. The evil nature constantly has a strong desire to suppress the spirit nature. And the spirit nature constantly has a strong desire to suppress the evil, the sin nature. Well, if the sin nature is removed, the evil nature is removed once we get born again, then why would the spirit nature be trying to strongly have a strong desire to suppress the evil nature? Well, I'll explain that in a few moments. And these are entrenched in an attitude of mutual opposition to one another so that you may not do the things that you desire to do. Our two natures are like two authorities side by side in one individual, in the saved individual, having each of those having a strong desire to suppress the other. And they are, these two natures are entrenched in, I love these words, in an attitude of mutual opposition. When our new nature wants to speak in tongues, tithe, or forgive people, the old nature opposes, and it desires to suppress these righteous things in the born-again one. When our evil nature wants to be lustful or critical, our new nature opposes and desires to suppress these evils. It said in that verse, you may not do the things you desire to do. This reveals that the flesh is hindered by the new nature. Likewise, the new nature is hindered by the flesh. All humans have an old nature that opposes righteousness, but the saved have an added internal part, a new nature. That is Holy Spirit and its workings, which is great, which greatly facilitates the renewed mind, which desires to do that which is right. Sins are repulsive to our new nature because they grieve God, hurt others, and kill self. Ephesians chapter 4. Ephesians chapter 4, steal no more, be not drunk. The unsaved may be somewhat aware of these things, uh, that these things are wrong, but the saved, having started learning the Bible, plus having spirit at work in them, have an internal, as we read back in Galatians 5, an internal strong desire to suppress stealing and drunkenness. These things are repulsive to their new nature. The saved may try to suppress these sins by natural abilities or by using laws, but the evil nature's strong desire to suppress the spirit. Again, what we read back in Galatians, the evil nature's strong desire to suppress the spirit frequently dominates, resulting in Romans chapter 5, or Romans chapter 7, the good that I would, I do not, but the evil which I would not, that I do. Oh, miserable man due to exhausting labor of trying to suppress the old nature. Oh, man that I am. Failure produces misery, disappointment, guilt. No stealing and drunkenness are simply cited as examples, but this list of unrighteous things could go on expansively. We try to correct other sins, laziness, lusts, depression, anger, etc., but too frequently, the good that I would, I do not, O oh, wretched man that I am. 
Romans chapter 5, 18 said, we have a justification which has issued in life, which means that we were given a new life born within. We had just had body and soul. Now we have spirit likewise. And this new, uh, this uh, issuing in of life gives us a new nature, which strongly desires to suppress the evil nature. Rather than skipping from Romans chapter 5, to latter parts or other portions of the Bible to learn about correct behavior. Well, if I'm constructing a toy, let's say, for a for my child when they're younger, and I get to step four, I don't then skip to step 38. No, logic dictates I move to step five, because if I skip to verse 38, I may regret what I omitted in verses five, six, and seven. Likewise, after reading Romans chapter 5 and realizing that via justification, a spirit life has been uh, issued into us, rather than moving to other parts of the Bible for correct behavior, logic dictates we just continue on into Romans 6, well, where we will read what God wrote next which is his method to correct behavior. Then the specifics of correct behavior can be read in the rest of God's word with an expectation of success. Romans chapter 5, as we verse 21, that as sin nature, noun, hath reigned unto death, Romans 3.23, for all have sinned, verb. Sin, noun, is one of the names God gives the nature we get from Adam. In contrast, sinned, verb, is wrong behavior. It's the fruit of the nature, the sin nature we got from Adam. Biblical teachers commonly use Sin, singular for the nature, sins, plural, for the fruit of the sin nature. Distinguishing between sin, singular, the root, and sins, plural, the fruit, is important. In Romans 6, verses 1 through 10, sin is always the sin nature noun. It is not acts of sin, verb. This is significant. For Romans chapter 6, verses 1 through 10, may be mistakenly read as stop sinning, verb. Encouraging avoidance of sins, verb. In contrast, God first draws attention to his fix to the root problem, which is our sin nature. The typesetting nature in bold print, noun, highlights that the verse is talking about a noun, the sin nature, not sin's action. Romans chapter 6, shall we continue in the sin nature, noun? God forbid, no. This is not saying stop sinning, verb, like stop stealing. Uh, Kenneth Wiest's expanded translation is helpful. Romans 6, shall we habitually sustain an attitude of dependence upon, yieldingness to, and cordiality with the sinful nature? May a, such a thing never occur. How is it possible? A rhetorical question. It is not possible for us, such persons as we are with oneness with Jesus Christ, who have been separated once for all from the sinful nature. How can we possible li possibly live in the sin nature's grip? Such persons as we are makes it impossible to live in sin nature's grip. 
This is not telling us to avoid sins, nor to break the sin nature's grip. It is telling us God changed us, so the sin nature's grip is broken. Chapter 6, verse 3. We who are placed in Christ Jesus, in his death were placed. Adam lost spirit and became sin nature. Likewise on the cross, when Jesus commended his spirit to God, he died spiritually, giving Jesus a sin nature. Then a moment later, his sin nature died when he died physically. The Gospel of Luke on the cross, he said, Father, into thy hands I commend my spirit. At that moment, he no longer had spirit. He died spiritually. He became like us. He became like Adam. He became just body and soul. Or as 2 Corinthians 5.21 says, he who knew no sin, and that word is a noun in Corinthians 5, he who knew no sin nature became sin. And again, it's a noun in 2 Corinthians 5.21. And then after he commended his spirit to God, he became sin nature. And then his next words were, or the next phrase says, and he, uh, he commended his spirit unto God, and he breathed out. He took his last breath, and he did not breathe back in. He died physically at that moment. In his death were placed means because of oneness, our sin nature died with him. So we are no longer just body and soul. Therefore, the saved cannot live in a dependent, cordial relationship to the sin nature, for our sin nature died when because of our oneness with Jesus Christ, because his sin nature died when he took his last breath. The result is, though uh, that sin nature is dead, though we may sin occasionally, and generally when I say that word occasionally to people, they say, well, you follow me around for a day, or they might even say, well, I'm going to follow you around for a day, Richard. And I think it's more than occasional. But based on the, the truth of the scriptures, it is way more occasional than most people realize. Sin in us is, sins in us are occasional. And we'll discuss that more a little later. Romans chapter 6, verses 1 through 10 is not telling us what kind of life to live. It's not rich with verbs. It's rich with nouns. It's telling us what God made us to be and what God accomplished. He's drawing attention to his work. And this is the beginning of God's method to holiness. All the rest of the scriptures about correct behavior for the born-again ones hinge upon what's recorded in these few verses. Our sin nature died through oneness because God imparted a new life into us. Romans 6, 4, as there <clears throat> was raised up Christ, thus also we by means of a new life imparted, we got the life he was resurrected with, we may order our behavior. The life Jesus Christ was raised with, we now have. Therefore, we are no longer just body and soul. Our new composition, spirit, body, and soul, is such that Holy Spirit is giving us information. Therefore, we may order our behavior by the information from the new nature. The King James Version says we should walk. 
should walk in newness of life. Many of you are familiar with that phrase. But that phrase, should walk, is an implication of a command. But the W-E-T and many other translations correctly say we may order. May order shows potential, not a command. It's not telling us what to do. It's revealing how we were altered with a new nature within. So we've got Holy Spirit at work within us. Six Romans 6, 1 through 10 is not telling us what to do but what God did and what we are because of oneness, but because humans are I, I, I beings. These verses may mistakenly be read as commands to stop sin. The unsaved's nature is hostily non-submissive to God, and their dominant source of information is the Satan-controlled world having their thoughts and behavior dominantly unrighteous. Slaves to the sin nature, they produce sins. But the saved, having spirit, they are changed beings, having a new nature. Having a new nature is a, a change of genus. A change of genus is not seen in biology, nor is it seen in the religions of the world. There is only one place where you will see a true claim of a change of genus, and that is in Christianity. For this change of genus is supernatural. Our change of genus or our change of our nature brings with it a change of characteristics. This change of genus would be like a cat being coming, becoming a dog. Well, that would be a change of genus. This being, though it had previously been a cat, though now it's a dog, uh, it can no longer meow or catch mice effectively for its genus. Its very nature has changed. And because of that, the characteristics in it will have changed. By nature, it's become very good at barking and fetching. Similarly, we are changed beings and sinning becomes less our ordinary. Righteousness and love are our ordinary because God changed our very genus. Romans chapter 6, knowing this, that our old man was crucified with him, that the body of the sin nature noun, it was made ineffective. It is ineffective in you. Please we will confess what God has said in his word, not go by our experience or our reasoning. Sin nature was made ineffective in you. And you'll notice the footnote there, uh, uh, number 38. Oh, I wish I could spend time on this, but the document in printed form is available for you to document this and see it with your own eyes. That henceforth, we should not serve the sin nature. God made our sin nature ineffective because it is dead. For we are alive with Holy Spirit working in us. The W-E-T translates the last phrase of this verse by, with the result that no longer are we rendering a slave's habitual obedience to the sinful nature. This is our condition and our result. It is not a command. If a Christian had wanted to remain a slave to sin, they should not have gotten born again. But now they can no longer remain a slave to the sin nature because it died. Romans chapter 6 verses 1 through 10 reveal what God did, not what we should do. Romans 6 is not a burdensome, overwhelming, irksome task. 
but a relieving revelation of our remarkable uh, new condition. If you think sin dominates in your life, you are mistaken, for the sin nature was made ineffective because your new because of your new makeup, you are now prone to righteousness. In contrast, the unsaved are prone to sins. Like God, we have pity, not anger, towards the unsaved and carnal Christians, because they, when they sin, they're just doing what comes naturally. Romans chapter 6, verses 1 through 10. Uh, has many other significant truths about our oneness with Jesus Christ, which you are welcome to ask for suggested reading material about. Romans 7 through 10 continue on and repeat more about our, white, our oneness and its disabling effect on the sin nature. We're going to skip 7, Romans 6, 7 through 10, so that we may move to the next truth God records. Look at how beautiful these verses in Romans 6 are with the understanding of the noun in here. Romans chapter 6 plus other truths. Shall we continue in the sin nature? How shall we that are dead to the sin nature live any longer therein? We cannot because we are no longer just body and soul. That like as Christ was raised up, meaning he was resurrected with a new life, even so, we also may walk in newness of life. Our very genus has been changed like the cat to the dog, knowing this, that our old man was crucified, that the body of the sin nature might be made ineffective, that henceforth we should not serve sin. Romans chapter 6, verses 1 through 10 reveal that with oneness, our sin nature died, for we are alive with Holy Spirit. Therefore, we are no longer just body and soul slaves to a nature which is hostily non-submissive to God with limited worldly information, for Holy Spirit is giving us godly information. So far, God has not told us to do anything. He has only told us what he did, what we are, what he is doing in us. By listing oneness with Christ first, God draws our attention to him and his work, not our sins or efforts to suppress them. In Romans 6, 11, God finally reveals our first action. But first, we need to read a little bit about the sin nature in the saved. Romans chapter 6, verse 6, our uh, old man, our sin nature was crucified. We are dead to sin. Our sin nature is crucified and dead. Well, hallelujah. But then we continue reading in verse 12. Stop allowing the sin nature to reign. Stop putting your members at the disposal of the sinful nature. Slaves of the sinful nature reign at the disposal of slaves of the sinful nature. Some may understandably ask, well, if the sin nature was crucified and is dead, how can it reign and we be its slaves? Well, the answer is, though the new birth gives us a new nature, it does not automatically rid us of wrong thoughts and habits. Though the sin nature is spiritually dead because of oneness with Christ, it can still reign in our thoughts by at least two means. Number one, previous wrong information and habits, ongoing additional wrong information from the devil-controlled world, uh, affecting our thinking and habits. But as we will relievingly read, after we take a break, our new nature is more powerfully at work within us 
freeing us from the sin nature. This is why 1 John chapter 4 says, greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. That new nature born within is powerfully at work within us, inspiring and directing us. I didn't say controlling. I'm saying inspiring and directing so that we can be free from the old thoughts and habits utilizing that asset of the new birth of Holy Spirit within. Love and righteousness are more a Christian's ordinary than God generally gets the credit for.